Hello, everyone. My name is Kyle Matthews. I'm executive director of the Montreal Institute for Genocide and Human Rights Studies. We're very pleased today to welcome you to Right City 2021. Uh, this year, uh, the focus of this conference is on human rights in the digital age. For those uh, who are following the news, you'll realize that digital technologies are having a major impact on human rights across the globe. And we've brought together a key group of the leading experts that are working at the intersection of emerging technologies and human rights. We're going to have sessions about the threat that the internet poses to democracy. We're going to be looking at digital authoritarianism. We'll be exploring how to confront online hate speech. We'll be looking at online disinformation and how that impacts democracies. And we'll also be looking at some other really new areas about the, the ideas behind having a, a digital Geneva Convention. Please share the links with your, with your friends, with your colleagues working on human rights. We will, of course, post these videos online after, so if you want to share them, you're welcome to. And you can also join the discussion on Twitter, where you can use the hashtag #RightCity to share some of the comments, the thoughts, or discussions being held. I would now like to invite all members of the first panel, Can Democracy Survive the Internet, to join us. Okay, it seems like almost everyone is here. Fantastic. I'm going to hand over to Rafal Rosinski who is a founder and principal of the SecDev group in Canada. Rafael, the floor is yours. Really, really pleased to be invited this year to moderate uh, this kickoff panel, uh, probably one of the more important panels that we're going to have this, uh, this, this, uh, this session. So the internet is just over 50 years old this year. In a blink of a historical eye, more than two thirds of humanity is now connected to a universe of information, economic opportunity and political intrigue. The internet is today's generic infrastructure for globalization. By some estimates, by 2025, the value of the new digital economy will be 25% of global GDP. That's 25% of all goods and services traded everywhere on the planet will have a direct digital link. The internet has also grown unevenly. The commanding heights, to use an old economic concept, are dominated by hyperscale platforms and providers. These titans of technology provide the silicone, steel and energy required to run massive data centers and in of themselves have become repositories of oceans of data that are the new black gold of the digital era. But economic concentration and the quantification of everything into monetizable data is only part of the story. The internet is also young in other ways. Two thirds of those connected to the internet are under the age of 35 and 50% are under the age of 25. These are young adults just entering into their most productive years. This is the demographic that is inclined to want change in the world and challenge the status quo. For the most part, the new internet cohort are not coming from advanced industrialized economies, but rather from emerging and transitioning economies where the rapid shift online has led to social and political pressures as traditional gatekeepers, family, schools, institutions, have been circumvented by direct access to the 24 by seven stream of entertainment, conversation and engagement from the likes of Facebook, TikTok, and the increasingly interactive gaming environment. Will democracy survive the internet? How will it change? Over the next 60 minutes, we'll delve into the depths of these associated questions. And joining us today is a stellar panel. They are Emily Dreyfus, a journalist and fellow at the Harvard Shorstein Center for Media, Politics and Public Policy. Also joining us is Sophie Zhang, a data scientist at Facebook for just under three years, who worked in her spare time to uproot state-sponsored troll farms run by Azerbaijan and Honduras. She's become a whistleblower after failing to fix the company from within. Also joining us is Alice Stolmeyer, who is the founder and executive director of Defend Democracy, a nonpartisan transatlantic foundation working to defend democracy. So let's get started. So Emily, I'd like to turn to you first. Is democracy actually in crisis or is this a crisis of the moment? Thank you so much, Rafal. Um, you know, I do not wanna be a pessimist, but we are certainly in a very serious moment for democracy and things, if we leave the situation as it is, it will not just work itself out. Um, democracy is something that has to be tended and um, taken care of and what we're, what we're seeing right now is that, as you all know, and as your work has shown, you know, the internet has accelerated and changed the way that bad actors can come together to coordinate, to um, 
undermine democracy, but it's not just disinformation and coordinated manipulation campaigns. It also allows people who would otherwise have had toxic beliefs or undemocratic beliefs or who believe that politics should not be democratic to have a much wider outlet and to use the fundamental infrastructure of the internet to connect and push that agenda. Um, you know, we were talking about what are human rights in this era? And one of the rights and fundamental pillars of democracy and the only way that it can work is if people who are citizens of democracies have access to true, accurate, local, timely information. We can't participate in democracy if we don't know the truth of what's happening in our world. That's one of the basic parts of it, right? And what we're seeing with the way that the internet right now has is, is uh, formatted and the ways in which we don't have safeguards and rails to protect against abusive behavior is that the internet right now is actually incentivizing a lack of accurate information. It's creating, I don't know if I would call it a crisis of democracy, but it's creating an information crisis for sure, where if someone is interested to find a fact or to learn what is going on with, let's say, a specific policy or a specific election in their nation, in Azerbaijan, in Canada, in the US, uh, going to the internet is where we go to find find those answers. But the way the internet is is set up right now, when you go to ask a question, what you can encounter is inauthentic people who are who are um, you know pretending to be real uh, influential and trustworthy sources, as Sophie's work at Facebook unearthed. All of the systems on the internet that we have right now to provide information to people in order to in enable them to make informed decisions about democracy are under attack, not necessarily, and, and this is the scariest part, it, it's not necessarily people using these systems incorrectly. They're using these systems the way they were designed to be used. And, and that's where technologists have to think ahead. They have to realize the ways in which they've created technologies that can and will be abused and that there will never be, it is impossible, as you said, with, with, with the printing press, there has never been a form of communication that doesn't include misinformation. You can't communicate in a world without misinformation. People will get things wrong. People will intentionally seed things that are incorrect. And we have to realize that and then create a system that accounts for it. And right now we are playing catch up. Alice, I, I wanted to turn to you here uh, because I know that some of the work that you've done, uh, particularly in terms of acting as a watchdog for elections and, and also some of the do's and don'ts for uh, online disinformation, um, presumably, you know, allow you to get a pretty good purchase on the question of whether or not this is really a crisis of the moment. In other words, a crisis when we have a mass population that's principally young, that has gone online, delving into a new environment where, where the, that range of experimentation is causing this distortion of democracy, or, or are we really looking at something which is much more fundamental, something more long-term? And I'm reminded here that, you know, our practice of democracy has changed over the decades. Let's not forget that the enfranchisement Enfranchisement of women, even in this country, uh, didn't happen all that long ago. And prior to that time, there was a different institutional order. So, so these things do change over time. So what's your view? Crisis of the moment or crisis of democracy? Well, for me, the question, can democracy survive the internet, is like asking, can climate survive fossil fuels? Hmm. Um, having worked in the past as a digital climate campaigner, I see many similarities between the big tech lobby and the fossil fuel lobby. Now, the latter has been denying science and delaying and obstructing regulation for over 50 years. And looking at the speed of new technologies shaping our societies and affecting our democracies, I don't think we have 50 years. I sometimes wonder we may not even have five years. So if we want democracy to survive, we really need urgent democratic oversight and more transparency and accountability of big tech. Sophie, maybe I'd like to turn to you next, uh, given the fact that you 
in some respects, lived within the body of Frankenstein for at least three years. Um, you know, it, it is fundamentally the architecture of, of these hyperscale social media platforms such that their ability to be regulated in the way that Alice was, was suggesting needs to happen for democracy to survive a reality? Or, or is that just fundamentally against the business model so much that, that these corporations either wouldn't survive or, or, or we won't survive in their present state? My answer is that in some ways, many of the social media companies counterintuitively have actually asked to be regulated. For instance, Facebook has asked for more digital regulation. And I think part of the reason for that is that first, the companies don't want to be arbiters of the public discourse. And secondly, that it would frankly enshrine the monopoly by as new new startups would have much more difficulty complying with regulation but that, that shouldn't be taken as an optimistic sign that everything is perfect because for instance when australia tri- tried to seek out and regulate social media companies itself it instead found itself hit with a hit with a news ban australia had had sought to incentivize social media companies require them to pay new, to pay news companies for, for publishing the articles. And instead, it was it was the one who was forced to compromise its goals. And many Silicon Valley companies and now, now into act with tech diplomats sent by other countries. These are the diplomats who essentially, instead of being sent to, to a foreign country, they are sent to Silicon Valley to speak with tech world. And I think this highlights the sheer power and and influence of social media companies, like like the fact that I myself, as frankly a very junior employee at Facebook, was able to convince the company to oppose the governments of Honduras and Azerbaijan. It's also a sign of that. How does exactly manipulation of uh, of of, uh, of 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 media? And this accountability for content fit within the cloud of regulation that, that that seemingly is going to help solve this problem in the future. There is not an easy answer, right? Um, if there was, we would have draft policy legislation um, that everyone who was there are so many smart people thinking about this problem, and if everyone had an agreed solution, we'd all be pushing that that regulation. Um, the truth is, absolutely, you know, you cannot you cannot have the internet and all of the good things that it provides if you uh, eliminate anonymity. However, I also would posit that even if you attempted to put in place a real name uh, requirement, or if you were going to do, you know, there are some platforms like in the US, there's a platform called Nextdoor, for instance, that um, you can only join if you live in the neighborhood. And it actually verifies that by sending you a letter in the mail. So there's there's blueprints for this kind of verification, but all of those systems can be gamed. There are definitely people who ma- manage to get onto next door who do not live in that neighborhood. Um, this issue of, of regulation that's backed up by enforcement, um, and in particular, this idea of positive ID, that in order to be on, on, on the internet, you have to have a, a verifiable identification. Um, how do you see that from the perspective of, uh, of, of creating accountability for actions on the internet? Does it strengthen democracy or does it particular, potentially create other kinds of pitfalls that uh, we need to watch for? Well, I think the the idea of uh, IDing people before they can use uh, a social media account or something is, you know, might seem attractive uh, for some obvious reasons, like, um, you know, um, there might be perhaps less bots and perhaps people might be uh, more polite online to each other. Um, But it's quite um, a different situation in uh, more authoritarian countries. Um, So there are definitely pitfalls and I would uh, an observation that I had is that even in a democracy like the United States, during the previous administration, many, many people had anonymous uh, accounts. So even in the United States, people felt that it might not 
necessarily be safe to reveal your true identity. Well, we'll, we'll return to this question of, of, of making and remaking democracy and perhaps making and remaking uh, the hyperscale um, uh, social media companies that have been so disruptive in this sort of third chapter of our discussion. But, but for the moment, I, I'd like to shine a little bit of a light on this question of disinformation and foreign interference. Um, there's a famous cartoon from, from the 1920s of a character called Pogo in the US. And uh, one of his famous taglines is, we have met the enemy and he is us. Um, so I think what I'd like us to, to turn to right now is to discuss a little bit, what do we know about disinformation in particular or foreign interference? The 2016 elections in the US and the subsequent Brexit vote in the UK have been held up as examples of foreign interference and disinformation designed to undermine democracy. And yet, the role of foreign interference in shaping voter behavior appears to be a magnitude lower than the organically generated political advertising supercharged through paid algorithmic means. So is foreign interference the principal threat, or is the issue the business model inherent to social media platforms? And, and Sophia, I'd, I'd like you to perhaps take a stab at this first, uh, because perhaps, you know, from your perspective inside the belly of the beast, you're your best place to give us some insight. Sophie? Thank you very much for, for asking. So first, I'd like to unpack this question a bit, since we've talked about disinformation and foreign interference. And so when people refer to disinformation, I, I frankly hadn't encountered this term very much until I left Facebook. And so it's and so people think and this information on the face of it is misinformation that is being intentionally spread. So there's also misinformation that people spread because they truly believe it, because they believe that vaccines will make your skin magnetic, because they saw a YouTube video or something like that. And there's and and at Facebook, this is also the term disinformation is also used to apply to what they call coordinated inauthentic behavior of, of, of inauthentic accounts essentially that are being used to spread specific messages regardless of whether the messages are true or false. Thank you very much for all the panelists. This has been a, a fascinating discussion. Uh, although we may not have uh, solved the future of democracy in the digital era, I think we've certainly enlightened the audience with uh, some insights about uh, concerning some of the issues that will be shaping it in the future. And, and perhaps as a, as a way of ending this panel and thanking the three of you, Alice, Sophie, and, and Emily, um, I'll use yet another classical illusion, uh, illusion from, uh, from, from Greek mythology. Once Pandora's box was opened, maybe as such as our technological age, and all the ills of the world were released, there was one thing left, and that one thing was hope. And on that, thank you very much, and uh, Kyle, handing over back to you. Thanks, uh, Rafael, for that uh, amazing job moderating. Alice, Sophie, and Emily, thank you so much for joining us, taking time out of your day. We're really happy that we were able to get all some amazing partners and speakers together uh, to make this um, Right City Conference take place. Um, I would like to first thank all the different partners who contributed this year uh, to this event. First, we thank the Raul Wallenberg Center for Human Rights, uh, the Department of National Defense's Targeted Engagement Program, uh, the Human Rights Research and Education Center at the University of Ottawa, led by John Packer, the Embassy of the Netherlands to Canada, Global Action Against Mass Frosty Crimes Network, the US Embassy to Canada, and this is also being held under the patronage of the Canadian Commission for UNESCO. Uh, thank you for joining us today. We're going to post these videos online soon, and please do join us tomorrow.